Um, I had a quick question before we start. Yes. Well, two. First, the what chapter does the midterm go up to? Uh, that's a good question. It goes up through UML design, actually the design chapter, uh, which is called what? Design, it's got a longer name. Let me see. What is it? Uh, through chapter seven, design architecture and methodology, but does not include implementation and testing quality assurance. So up through chapter seven. Cool. Yes. And again, uh, yes. For, so that's for the midterm and, and also the study guide is a, is a big resource in that or um, looking at what things to look at and study. Okay. Yeah. And then on the requirement specification, it says each member is to upload a copy. Um, when we uploaded ours, one team member uploaded it, and then it still showed that as uploaded under mine. Yes, that that is incorrect. I think it does. it is taking group submissions for that. Okay. Is that so what you're asking? Shows, yeah. yeah. So if it shows it's submitted, then that should be fine. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Right. Thank you. Yep. So I am in the process of sharing the new presentation. Here we go. So here is a, a review of UML diagrams. Um, we went over it in the design chapter. So here's just the plethora of UML diagrams. We discussed that. And so we talked about class design. Class design represents real world entities or system concepts, but it is a um, modeling of that. It is, you know, of course you can't completely um, represent the real world concept, but it is a, a model that's useful for your system that you're trying to employ. Um, classes have properties or attributes, the data. And when that's here, we have this, the date of birth and the name, and they also have methods. And so those are the different operations that can be formed on that data or um, performed by that class. So that's the general concept of class design. Here's the um, sort of the notation that is used for class diagrams. So we here have here that first block on the top is class name, attributes, and attributions. So that so you basically do the rectangle with the class name at the top, and then below that, two different sections below it, the attributes and the operations. And we can see that in the previous slide here, we have student, our attributes are the date of birth and name, and the methods are listed here. Um, we also see that it actually has the type uh, associated with those data elements, and that is, you know, a personal preference how much detail you want to have in your actual design, or just leave that to the implementation. Um, and then the arrows between the various class blocks that you have here with the class name, attributes, and operations are association, which is strictly a line with text, and a lot of times there'll be an arrow that says that you read the association from this point to this point. Uh, so this would be like um, something modifies this or this class um, reads from this or, or, or something like that. So there would be some verb, verb, action verbs that would describe what the association is. The other one is a line with the open arrow, the open triangle, which is an inheritance relationship. So that's your standard uh, object-oriented uh, class inheritance. We have the solid filled in uh, version of that, which is realization, which I generally don't see too often in class diagrams that I see, but um, that is part of the notation. And then um, the dotted line with the just the straight 
arrow with with not the triangle is a dependency. So that means that uh, that class actually uses the other class in some fashion. That there, uh, in particular, it's generally there is part of the data contained within the class is actually a reference to that other class that you're pointing to that says that we have a dependency. Um, again, dep it depends on how much detail whether you would include dependencies. I, I see a lot of diagrams that don't have dependencies listed at all. And so that is, again, a personal preference and what you're trying to convey in your design diagram is would show would depend on where you would show that. Uh, and then we have the two uh, notations for aggregation and composition. Again, aggregation is a collection of other objects that um, there isn't a strict dependency. So, uh, so the class that's doing the aggregating is the one that has the um, diamond connected to it. So it's the class on the left that actually is doing the aggregating. Uh, or the composition. And uh, the way to think about it is that the thing on the left cannot exist without the thing on the the items that it's aggregating or, uh, or composing on the right. And that's composition where there's a dependency. And um, also you would say that the things on the right uh, can't exist or have no meaning unless they're composed in the object on the left. Whereas aggregation is a basically a lesser connection there, there's an aggregation but one of the object on the left and the right can exist without the other uh, so that's sort of the way to choose between aggregation and composition so uh, in our previous lecture we showed here is a representation of inheritance so you see that open triangle and so we see the person can't uh, can have two uh, abstract or two uh, varieties that inherit of classes that inherit from that, and that is a student and an employee uh, in this example. So both of those inherit it from parent from person. So that's the inheritance relationship that you show on the diagram. The other is um, association. So we have here that zero to many, and you see either an asterisk or sometimes you see N using there. Uh, zero to N students are, are associated with a school. And we can see here it's a rough association because it actually the school can exist with zero students in this example. And then on the opposite side, it says there's a one-to-one -one relationship between schools and students. So that says that that a student only attends one school. So that is um, the way it's modeled in this diagram. Uh, so for aggregation uh, composition, um, so that's the enrolled relationship, just association. For the aggregation, we have here a composition because it's filled in that says the student uh, has an address and it's, com it's composed of uh, addresses so that a student has to have an address. So uh, that is what is being modeled here, is that it's composed of addresses. So you can see that addresses could also be used for the school. The school could also uh, contain an address so that, or be composed of addresses as well. So um, that is uh, aggregation and composition again aggregation is the open arrow one and composition is the full filled in uh, diamond. So here we have uh, the UML class diagram that we showed before. Um, and you can see here the cardinality, the multiplicity, which is the one to star uh, or zero to 12 in the case of an account borrow, uh, borrowing a book. Um, you could have 0 to 12 books, or you could have reserved books, only 0 to 3 of the reserved books, so uh, or of uh, book reservations, sorry. And uh, we can see here on the on the left, I, I need to make sure I describe because I, I what I'm saying you can see here, you're not really seeing where I'm looking, but we can see here between book and book item, 
there is an arrow on the upper left hand corner with an open triangle and that's the inheritance relationship so a book item uh, is inheritance from its abstract class uh, the book and then we can see here that the library has uh, aggregation of books and composition um, of catalogs so they're saying basically the library can't cannot exist without catalogs and so there is and catalogs cannot exist without libraries so that's the composition um, we see uh, realization which is the dotted arrows uh, with the open triangles and uh, dependencies so that's the dotted lines with just the uh, non-triangular arrows but just a, a traditional cat so and then we see the in parentheses it uses so uh, a patron uses a search uh, a librarian uses a search and um, a library uses manage the manage interface or a manage object uh, and then we see here that they actually have wrote borrowed and reserved are all the association uh, verbs that describe the association and notice the black arrow that points to uh, the way that you read it so an author wrote a book an account borrowed a book or an account reserved a book uh, i'm sorry book item account borrowed a book item or reserved a book item so that's how you would read uh, that association and we see here that um, a patron uh, has an aggregation of accounts so any questions about class diagrams in my chat session got hidden again let me bring that back up again so is this more intended to represent the concept of the solution or more the implementation like is this closer to how uh, this, close is it to the actual code implementation since it's it, using it, class notation yes it, it 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 is a design so it's a high level design about how your classes will interact with each other but you can as you can see uh pointed out this um Jason, this this actually um, goes right into implementation. And in fact, a lot of the UML uh, drawing tools that you use to create these diagrams will actually have a button that says uh, implement skeleton code because it can see exactly what you're doing. And if you have this complete enough, um, you can actually have you actually have enough information that you could feed that directly into implementation. So it's sort of that design uh, gray area. It's looking at your uh, design before you jump into implementation, but it actually is taking you into the implementation phase directly, as you pointed out, Jason, that this does look a lot like a pictorial diagram of your implementation, and it is. So that's a good point. So this type of diagram wouldn't work all that well if you're working on a solution that doesn't implement very well using object oriented. That's right. This is this is really closely tied to uh, it is object oriented design strictly. It is object oriented design, which object oriented design does lend itself to object oriented implementation. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't do object oriented design and do like a functional uh, style program, but it is a much more difficult transition. So it really is and predominantly is tied to object oriented design and implementation. So, yes, that's right. OK. Oops, focus. Uh, use case diagrams, we looked at that, um, and that's just the, in, the user's interactions with your system. Uh, that's again, was covered in the previous lecture on design. Um, and um, 
here's the state machine notation di diagrams. Uh, these diagrams were, were uh, borrowed or used uh, from umldiagrams.org, which is a, a valuable resource for figuring out um, UML diagrams. Now, uh, state diagrams are um, not new. Uh, all the other engineering professions have used state diagrams and electrical engineers in particular use them quite a bit, uh, especially for digital design. Um, so it's not new, but the UML has standardized the notation that's being used. Again, there was uh, multiple camps of design, object-oriented design that were um, that were coming about at the time that UML was created, and this was an attempt to standardize all of them so that if you, no matter which of the different um, object-oriented design techniques you use, that the notation would be similar because a lot of the techniques are basically similar. Uh, so um, here we see a, an oval or um, a rounded edge, yeah, an oval, I guess, or a rounded edge rectangle, which represents the state. Uh, and then on the top is the title of the state. So this is the description or the name of the state. And then below that, entry welcome and exit slash thanks is uh, the methods or the function that are the um, the actions that happen on entry into the states. So here we see waiting for user input is the name of the state in this example. And then on entry, you do the welcome. And then on exit from the state, when you leave the state, it does this thanks operation. So you can see here that you have tied to it um, actions that are associated with entry and exit into the state. So for us, for us, for the uh, computer engineers in the group, who knows where the other place that you can actually tie actions might exist. So this is associated with Mealy and more, but in electrical engineering, uh, predominantly, but also for software engineering, there is the possibility that you can put the accents associate it with the event itself rather than with the state. But here we have this, the actions associated with entry and exit into the state. Uh, composite state is basically where you have a, a overarch that you have substates contained in an overall state. So you can actually be describe behaviors of entry and exit into the composite state. And then you would have actions associated with entry and exit into the substates, which are customer authentication, attraction, transaction are the substates in that composite. And then serving customer is the uh, global state that contains this, the composite state. And uh, this is associated with uh, a hierarchical state machine. So um, that is... Um, Again, a higher level technique. I, I don't uh, expect you to be using a hierarchical state machine off the bat, but that is the notation for a composite state. The initial pseudo state is basically this uh, circle, this filled in black circle that says this is the state uh, in which the state machine starts. So this is the starting state, which is waiting for user input. So this is a pseudo state that's starting and which says, okay, we make this transition to waiting for user input as we start. And then uh, on the other side, we have final state, which is that same filled in circle with a, another circle drawn around it. And that is final state, which means that uh, this state machine is done and it's complete, which also means that um, this class or this, op the, this instance of this object has also exited. It is being it is leaving. So this is a termination state. So that's the final state. So here's a, a representative state machine. We can see here our initial state is idle. So you can see that filled in black circles pointing to idle. And then we have um, two other states that the system can be in is out of service and active. 
Uh, so we can see here that a service event comes in and and that says, okay, we move from from idle to out of service, which means that this, the ATM machine can't be used. And then when it's fixed, it goes back into idle, idle state. Uh, so here we see that if a card is inserted into the ATM machine, so it's in card, it becomes active. And uh, when the user cancels the operation, it goes back to, to um, idle or when the activity is done, uh, it goes back to idle. So this is a very simple um, state machine example of using the notation. Uh, and this is sequence diagrams. So let's go back to the state machine. So one of the things that I saw um, with McKinnon's was that his state machine started getting into actual uh, control flow and um, so whenever you see your state machine uh, becoming more like a flow chart, uh, then that's an indication that um, this is not really part of your state machine because these are the uh, specific states that the class can be in. It isn't necessarily all the operations that it's performing, but it's states that it can currently exist. I know it sounds, it's kind of a, a subtlety at this point, but as you get more experience using them, you'll get the recognized difference. But if that is the case, if you're actually describing um, the flow of actions that this class is doing, that it is the perfect opportunity to use a sequence diagram. Uh, you can see here that you can have multiple actors involved, uh, so different classes and events that are being passed through them and their interactions. Uh, the other thing is it's it's not part of the um, UML class or the UML diagramming methodology, but an old school flow chart is fine too. Uh, it's easily understandable and definitely multiple professions recognize and can easily use um, a state diagram. In fact, I mean a flow chart. In fact, even non uh, engineers or technical people can follow flow charts. It's considered old school, but it's, it is effective. So I have no problems with saying, okay, if this is indeed flow of different operations, I, uh, then maybe a flow chart is the correct uh, diagramming technique to use. And uh, like I said, it's considered old school, but I have no problem with a flow chart. And then a communication diagram, which is heavily used in the real-time arena, but we won't go too much into uh, UML communication diagrams, but it is used in real-time systems. Okay. So it says I can share this with the attendees. So I just sh am sharing this this PowerPoint presentation. Um, I don't know if you get it as an email, but it says it has been sent to you. Oh, it's probably through Microsoft Teams. Anyway, I sent this presentation to all of you. Uh, let me know how you receive it. I have I, That's the first time I've done that, but when I bring up my PowerPoint presentation, it actually does say that I can share this with the attendees. So I can, let's see. I just received it over email. Okay, and that's what um, Addy also said. So it sent you an email of the PowerPoint presentation, and I and I just emailed my um, ad administration slides as well. So that's pretty cool. So there is some nice integration between the various tools here for Teams. I am using Zoom as well for items from church, or actually I met with my men's Bible study group in California, which was great because we have people scattered throughout the country now. Um, and uh, it was sort of like a homecoming. And so we use Zoom for that. So I'm I'm see getting to see the advantages and disadvantages of both. Oh, so Cheer said he actually got it via OneDrive, that it actually showed up on his OneDrive somehow. So that's cool. 
I would have expected it to show up in the files tab of teams, but I guess that would make too much sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and the other possibility is that, um, that we don't have the license for it too. I'm not sure exactly what the Laternal license is for Microsoft teams and which, uh, abilities and we have and don't have. Okay. So, um, Let's take a look at this. So we looked at uh, Caden and McKinnon's diagrams. So here we have Spencer's diagram. Let me share it. I know it's not being shared. Yeah. Uh, where is it? Oh, here it is. So can you see uh, Spencer's slide or PDF? Sorry. I can see it. Yes, I can. Okay. And... Okay, so we have here that he has an elevator and he has uh, attributes, the uh, current floor and then the directions, which is a string. Uh, so is that um, up and down, Spencer? Let's see, is Spencer, I mean, uh, Spencer on the line? Okay, so Spencer's not in the chat. Uh, so he has um, um, an elevator, which um, ha contains buttons, and then he's moved floor. So you can see here that that the elevator is actually going to uh, either co compose or aggregate the buttons, and then he has some relationship between but the button oh the the inheritance relationship it should be an open triangle i believe uh is um what he was trying to represent here so the uh floor button would be uh a line between the floor button and the button with an open triangle pointing to the button would be the way to show inheritance. So. So there is a question um, whether he's having connection issues. I'm not sure. I ha did not get a message whether he's having problems getting in or not. So I'm not sure what uh, Spencer's situation is. Okay. Uh, and then we have Isaacs. And let's see, I'm going to have to rotate it because it's showing oh, upside down. There we go. So let's share that. Here, here's Isaacs, uh, nice. So he has that the um, elevator is com composed of doors and uh, it's composed of, of floor buttons, very nice. And um, the button, and so we have inheritance of the up button, the down button, and the floor button, very nice. And the floor uh, composes up buttons and down buttons, correct? Okay. And it looks like he even has uh, a little bit of pseudocode there. Uh, so those would be, oh no, those are, those are, well, in the floor he has some pseudocode. 
but on the on the elevator you can see that he does have the uh, actions that can be 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 form, performed on the elevator get direction get current floor so that's exactly right those are the different things that an elevator can do so this is uh, a very nice diagram isaac good job and let's see next submission is michael Let's see, I think I got this. Oh, first, my first document. Okay. Oh, pretty. Let me share that. Adobe Acrobat. Okay, so um, here's his class diagram. Uh, very pretty. What tool were you using, Michael, uh, to drawing this with? Um, I used the Lucid charts. Oh, does a really nice looking diagram here. Um, is that um, a free tool or is that a tool you had to purchase? It's not free, uh, but the first document that you do is free. So I just kept deleting the document and keep doing it over for <laughs> the other ones that I needed to do. So this is, is nice. an, on an online tool? Is that? Yeah, it's online. Oh, cool. Nice. So anyway, he has the send buttons, which I assume are the ones inside the elevator. And uh, the state is he has a light, a Boolean. Um, I'm assuming one would be on and one would be off. And I would probably think true might would be on. Um, oh, and we see uh, Nate uh, submit it. See, do you go by you go by Nathan, don't you? Or Nate? Nathan, I think. Anyway. Uh, Nathan put up a, a link to Lucid Charts. Yeah, Nathan. Okay, it's the other one, the other Nathan that goes by Nate. Yeah, I just realized that. Thank you. Um. So again, the doors open and closed is open. You probably want to have two uh, other methods that be that would be either change the state or. Um, probably a close and an open method must be associated with the doors. Move up, move down is going up. Excellent. Uh, we see here we have the aggregation of um, doors for the floor and the call buttons and the elevator. So, yeah, we can have. Um, so he has here that there are. two or more floors is that what i'm reading and there is one so. elevator yes and i think that was from the description mm -hmm. yeah good and then he has um the state diagram and so we can see here that Station at target floor and is waiting, so basically it's it's idle. And then when the button is pressed, it's going up. Or when button is pressed, going down. I guess that would depend on which of the buttons you pressed. And then when arrived, you're stationed at the target floor and wait. Uh, we have the send button state, which is on and off when pressed, when arrived. Excellent. Um, it would turn off when, when it's arrived at the floor. Uh, we have the door state diagram, open or close. When arrived, it opens. When it's moving, it's closed. Um, there's also probably a delay period when it would close on its own before you even start moving. Or, or maybe that is that delay could be uh, moving and close so that you close the door and then start moving. So they could be one and the same. That's, that's a good point. Uh, and then um, the call buttons. Nice. Very nice. So, uh, Jason, you might have to ch check out Lucid Chart there. He's, his comment was very pretty. Yes, it is. 
how easy was it to use that tool, Michael? Because I know that Visio is very complete and actually has the ability to generate code. But I find I I like in general um, Visio, but I do find it hard to do UML diagramming using Visio, Microsoft Visio. How easy was that, uh, Michael, for you to use that to, uh, the Lucid charts? It was it was pretty simple. Um, I just is mostly just dragging it in, and then they had um, uh, on the arrows you could click multiplicity um, and right. it will it will pop up numbers on either end so you didn't have to like drag it in or anything right, so right, it was right. really it was really nice and really easy uh, yeah I liked it okay so uh, if you're looking for a tool to do UML diagramming there there you go it sounds like it's a pretty nice tool um, you probably didn't have enough chance to play with it to see if it actually will generate um, uh, initial code in, ter in languages. I bet you probably haven't didn't didn't see that at all or look at for that because that's not what your goal was. But yeah, I didn't I didn't look at that. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, it'd be interesting to see. But it sounds like it is it, specifically um, aimed at doing UML diagramming and other di type of group diagrams as well. It has a bunch of different templates, uh, and so they had. UML diagrams, state diagrams, so they, but they had a bunch of different ones. Good. All right, so let's go back to. I got too many sc screens up now. Here we go. Submissions. So, those of you, do, you probably don't know my setup, but I actually have a three screen setup. And so I've got things plastered all over the place now. Nice. <laughs> I miss mine. I need to get it set up again. Yeah. So uh, Jonathan Dyke's uh, diagram, we see here. Ah, so he has that um, a relationship between the controller and the button that uh, the button uses the controller. Nice. And the, the concept of a controller is a very common um, way to, to design things. A controller or a supervisor, especially in a real-time system like that, is very common. So um, controllers and, su and supervisors are often um, classes that get uh, end up being used in systems like this. Uh, so we have buttons and we have the elevator and a floor button inheriting from it. Um, we have the state of the controller. It's waiting. It's doing going moving up, or it's moving down. The uh, the up and down cycle. The elevator is not necessarily moving up during the down cycle. It's collecting the uh, down. Um, requests, right? So that's and same with the up cycle. That's its preferred direction, basically. You're you're doing the elevator thing of saying, okay, I'm on floor three and I'm going up, so I'm going to look at four, five, six, and I'm not going to even consider one and two. Is that what you mean? I think that's what you mean. Yeah. So, um, yeah, exactly. Um, that is uh, a very much an operating systems concept as well as we talk, look at disks access, but um, to have it in a state where it's looking at floors going up from where I'm at and going down from where I'm at later um, is, is valuable. And um, the events aren't uh, labeled, but I would assume that it would be when um, all the um, floors in the up cycle have been exhausted or visited that that would then transition you to the down cycle uh, state and same thing with the down cycle going to the up cycle um, and so how do you get from the up cycle back to the waiting state 
Jonathan. If you finish your upcycle and there's no um, requests on a down cycle, it would go to waiting and back to the bottom floor. Right. And we can see that both the dying cycle and from the upcycle, you go to the waiting state in those conditions where there aren't any other requests. Good. Very good. Excellent. And then we have that the button is waiting to be pressed and it's actively pressed. And I would assume that when you're active, you're illuminated. So great. That's very nice. Nice design. And I like the fact that you came up with um, a controller to manage everything, the, basically the supervisor of, of everything. Um, going to do an extract here. Okay. So these are Jonathan Edwards. Let's go first to his class diagram. And I'm going to get rid of some of these just so it doesn't get huge. Okay, so here's his elevator system. We see the relationships between the elevators and the buttons. Directional button. Okay, so for the parent class, uh, that's uh, correct. The directional button is, uh, but you want to use the open triangle uh, notation-wise. Yeah, but, I didn't figure out how to use the different lines and stuff with the lucid charts, so yeah, <laughs> there shouldn't be arrows. I can understand that. It, it would be using a brand new tool kind of situation. Uh, and then uh, light, and that's um, the button contains the light. Is that what yeah. that? Yeah. So that could be either an association or an aggregation or composition. I would assume there would be an association because... Uh, generally, it's going to be only a one-to-one -one relationship, and it's pretty tight. But, of course, you can you can do uh, multiple things. You wouldn't have multiple lights associated with a button, unless you had red and green and blue that meant different things. But, um, yes. Okay. And then we have your state diagram. Power on is your enter into the elevator waiting state, and then we have a terminal state. Power off. Excellent. Uh, so elevator is waiting. The up button is pressed. Elevator is going up. Uh, floor down button is pressed. Elevator is going down. Um, so yeah, nice state di uh, state transition diagram. And um, then you would have to complete this, but this is certainly complete. You know, if this is all that you're trying to convey. But you could also put in these states what actual what actions action, actions actually happen in these states. But this is this is great. So this is Ethan's uh, diagram, and we can see here he has the. the Floor inhel inheriting from um, elevator, is that correct? Is that what you're trying to convey here, Ethan? No, that wasn't. I uh, I wasn't sure which arrow to use right there, so I just used a normal arrow. Right, right. Okay. So here we, we probably... Um, so the floor up and down... So there's a, probably an association there between the floors and the elevator. Uh, the door, the elevator uh, composes doors. So yes, the, the elevator would have to have a door. So that's composition. And then floor buttons, it has to have floor buttons. And then we have the inheritance, which is correct. Uh, the button in, uh, has two types, or the floor button inherits from buttons, and the up-down buttons also um, inherit from button. And then he has two booleans, so that's the other approach is it with of having two different buttons is actually having an attribute. Uh, that's nice. And then um, the floor composes up and down buttons. So nice, nice, Ethan. So 
So here we have the uh, class diagram from Gabe, right? You go by Gabe? Uh, yes, I do. Yes. So uh, here we have, again, the elevator composes, composes doors, um, right? Inheritancing from button, looks very familiar. Nice. And yeah, does that make sense? So we have we have a button uh, that just is like a general button. And then for on the floor and on the elevator, there are two different instances of that button that each of them uh, aggregates. Right. That that inherent is from the, the button. That is that is right. That is correct. And then you actually use the um, individual um, children of button in in your relationship with the other classes which looks right to me too yeah looks good nice job and thanks there are two state diagrams to go along oh uh yes i didn't thank you Here's his button, active, and the light is true, and the black light equals false. And the inactive state, floor reached, is when it becomes inactive, and the button pressed is what makes it true. Uh, we, if your button is pressed while it's already active, it stays active. Nice. And... Open and close of the door. Departure commenced. It's closed. And then the arrived at destination. This is when you open. Nice. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to... So I'm going to actually skip. Well, no, let's do it in order. I was going to skip and do all the uh, PDF ones at once. So I'm going to have to reshare um, on this one. So I had some students that did PDFs and some that uh, did uh, images, JPEGs. So... Where is it? Here. Okay. So you should see uh, Daniel Jones's um, class diagram. He has the building that contains the elevators. Yes. Uh, there you would probably probably do a, a composite. Well, actually, the building can't exist without an elevator. But you do some type, you do an aggregation that aggregates elevators, uh, and then we have the doors that uh, get aggregated into the elevator and the buttons. Yes, and let's share his state diagram. Is that it? Yeah, that's it. That's the right one. Uh, so here he has a state diagram. Button illuminates, elevator summoned to floor, reaches floor, door opens, floor number chosen. So this um, is an excellent flow chart, but it's not actually quite a state diagram. So what you would do is you would actually... Um, focus on on the behaviors and the states of a single object you've actually included um, all your objects in this so that this is really um, more of a flow chart and uh, that's common when you're first getting started state diagrams will start looking like flow charts and then you have to scale back and say okay we're looking at only the button what does the button do 
we're looking at only the door. What does the door do, et cetera? So, um, yeah, it's a good flow chart, but um, it is a flow chart. So a flow chart or sequence diagram would be appropriate for this, where you show the interactions of what happened for the different objects. Uh, but to go to a state diagram, you would focus on each of the different um, classes or objects um, one at a time. So let's close these. But I'm liking this. You guys are all getting experience, getting to see. Oh, so actually I'm out of time now. So we'll go. I So we're um, going to go to Jason's next. But having said that, um, any questions? <laughs> Saved by the bell. I have a question. Yes. The question is, there is a a little, a couple of lines on the requirements assignment on Canvas that talks about a, essentially a functioning prototype that is also due. Uh, did you mean for that to be due today? Because our team had was not really aware of that, and we haven't made one of those. And if it's due today, I don't know how good it's going to end up being. Uh, let's see. You already did the... Um... The low fidelity prototype in your your uh, description. So we no. did the, yes. the visual prototype. Yes. Good good point. I um, missed that when I moved the assignment date. I was intending it for it only to be the SRS, and that's all I'm going to be expecting. Uh, the prototype will be a new assignment move to later. So thank you for pointing that out, Gabe. Um, that is not the intent. It was the original intent, I think, for the semester. But now that we're online and I'm trying to space things out a little bit more, um, that is a good point. The SRS only, uh, the prototype is not part of that assignment. And that's what I've been seeing turned in. And that's all that I'm expecting at this point. Now, some of those, uh, some of the students have done for their low fidelity prototype in their description. Um, concept description have done um, at least preliminary high fidelity, and that just means you're ahead of the game. But yes, no, for today, um, only the SRS, not, I had, for, I didn't even realize that that was that way. I guess I didn't look at it that closely or at all. I just kind of moved it with the SRS specification. So yeah, no. Okay, the, great. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? So I'm I'm very happy with the submissions as we go through um, the submissions. I actually had um, a solution that I had put together. Um, the quality of what I I've, I've seen indicates I might not even need to do that, but um, I might do it anyway. Just just you can see because frankly I know I did my solution quick enough that I know that under scrutiny of review, there's probably mistakes in mine as well. And that's, um, again, the advantage of design reviews is, you know, you're going through this and you miss things. And uh, so that might be a good exercise in having a design review of UML <laughs> diagrams where you guys can look at what I came up with and say, hey, wait a minute, uh, Professor Lim, I, I think you have something missing there. What happens if this happens? And are, are you reflecting that in your design? So. I think we may may look at it from that perspective because um, basically the designs I've seen are to the level that I can see that there is some understanding um, about UML design being formed. And so that purpose of me showing my um, solution is is not as as necessary because you guys are um, obviously getting it. So that's great to see. All right. I also have a question about the uh, requirements. Um, when you talk about uh, stakeholders, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Um, so the stakeholders are the the person who's actually using it. Uh, a stakeholder could be um, the person who's commissioning it. That like if if they're bosses or something. Um, for your pro your project was a game, right? That's correct. So I think your your 
probably one and only stakeholder is the player of the game because I can't imagine that, well, maybe a stakeholder could be the IT department if it, the game is meant to be played at uh, Laterno and do you think they might be locking down some capabilities? But in general, I think yours is just the game. So the stakeholders are just basically who is involved or who who do I have consequences for uh, for this product? Is it um, both management and the employees that are using it? Is it the um, service department that has to service it? Uh, IT department, I like I said um, in an earlier lecture, uh, one of my projects last year uh, for or actually last semester for software engineering two, they had this nice product and it came out and then they found out that um, I, the IT department for the fire department would re-image the disk, basically put a new brand new image of the disk on the system every night or every morning. And that would mean that their software would disappear every morning. And so the there was an issue with, oh my gosh, is this tool even useful if they have to reload the software every single time? And what do we do about that? So I, ID department ended up being one of their stakeholders. So that's what we mean by stakeholders. So yeah, for you, since it's a game, I would imagine it's really just strictly the user. So does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. All right. So unless we have any other questions, I'll go ahead and uh, – so for the operating environment, what are you looking for in a diagram? Um, does it actually say that a, a diagram is required, uh, McKinnon? Or should I say Mikey? It mentions the diagram. Okay. Um, it's probably not necessary in your case to have a diagram for the operating environment. You can just kind of explain that it's going to be running on um, a Windows computer supporting Windows 10 um, and, and maybe Windows 7 or whatever the operating environment is. Uh, you probably don't need to have a diagram or you could just say, yeah, it's simple enough the diagram is not necessary that we're just going to, yeah. So I, I would not uh, take that too much literally that uh, I don't think in that case a diagram would be necessary. Oh, okay. So, and then Ethan just point pasted a link on examples of lucid charts. So is that um, on how to use um, lucid charts, Ethan? Is that what that YouTube video is about. I guess you you can go to the link and and find out for yourself. So anyway, any other questions or comments before we um, finish? Because I did run over time here. It looks like. All right. Well, have a great day, and I really enjoyed uh, the chat session. Thank you. Thanks. Goodbye. Yep. Goodbye.